We're going to go ahead and start the, the question and answer. I know everybody's like trying to jump in and that's fine. I'll, I'll come right over to you. So basically he was talking about if I'm going to sell something, how do I research it or where should I go to research it to be able to see if it has a patent or any issues with it? So that's a good question, Jeff. Where, where do we go or how, how do we do that? So like first step is like your knockout search and you're, you can do that yourself. So you go to like the United States Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO.gov. And so for patents, you can search them there. Um, it's kind of complicated. Google Patents has a pretty easy way to search for patents. Um, that's probably easier than the USPTO. For trademarks, uh, the USPTO's website is the better one out of, you know, I think there's a couple like trademark search sites that you can use. I think um, Google has a trademark I, search now. I don't think they have, well, I don't know. Maybe they Or maybe it's now. a patent. They have Google Patents. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. they have trademarks, um, but the USPTO site is so easy that it, it makes sense to go there. Um, but that would be like your first round. So like you think you have this great idea for like a shirt that you're going to call like Under Armour. You go there and you type it in and see. And then when you realize that there's nothing like that you can't sell it, then you, you can knock that out yourself. Then when you start getting more specific and you're more serious about launching something, you know, it's, it's a risk benefit. So if you're launching something that you think is, you know, really close to an existing product out there, like maybe that would possibly have a patent, that's when you have to, as a business owner, figure out is it worth it to, tr to chance it or do I want to hire you know, a lawyer? Because we've got tools like Core Search and other patent search tools that cost a lot of money, but you know, that's why we charge money for it. You know, we can't do it for free because we get charged for every search that we do. And that's where we can search you know, multiple variations. And so like our search would look and see like if you, for instance, you know, Under Armour is spelled um, A-R-M-O-U-R and our search would look if you typed in A-R-M-O-R would find the uh, variation so you know we're going to search for misspellings and everything else to make sure that you're in the clear before we issue you know a clearance letter and so that's where you know so first rounds you can definitely do it yourself and then if you have concerns then you want to think about and like for instance I know that there's a guy on Fiverr I've heard of this before he charges uh, $15 for a patent search um, that won't hold up in court because he's not even in the United States. He's in, I don't know where he is. I think he's in China and he's just like doing a full patent search and he issues a clearance letter that says that you've got no concerns with patents. And like when uh, an attorney does it, they actually issue a clearance letter that if you get sued can be used to, it, you show the court that the, the attorney did the search. And even though the attorney maybe got it wrong, the fact that the attorney did the search and you've got this letter from the attorney means that you're not being you're not going to be found for like willful infringement and willful infringement versus accidental infringement puts you in two different categories of damages and so if you don't do any search at all and you don't or you get a fake search done then you could be found in that willful category whereas if you get a real search done then it puts you in the non-willful you know it was an accident category and so it's yeah. a risk benefit analysis to figure it out. Question? So you were asking, he had his first LLC and then he switched to his other one and it was regarding the insurance that he had with it? Or was there any yeah. other thing that he wanted to change? Or the reason why? Yeah, because yeah. It, was, it was, at the end of the day, it was still LLC. So why did you create a new one? Okay. So the initial one was formed and it was in one state. And the second one I f we formed in Delaware, and that was just because Delaware has better case law okay. from a corporate perspective. So for instance, um, the reason why a lot of companies are Delaware corporations or Delaware LLCs is because if you have a business dispute, they're ho heard in the state of Delaware Court of Chancery. And the state of Delaware Chancery Court is made up of only lawyers who practice in Wilmington corporate law. And you have to be nominated by your peers and then confirmed by the state of Delaware through like the uh, legislative process to get onto that court as one of the judges. Whereas traditional states, um, like if you have a dispute in like say Alabama, it's going to be heard by somebody who ran for an election in Alabama, might not even be a lawyer, but as yet they're a judge because they won the community popularity contest and they're deciding your business dispute. So with Delaware, we just, we reformatted it there because it just made sense from a legal perspective and everything to have a Delaware LLC. So that was primarily the reason for the change because. Go ahead. Follow up? <clears throat> so if we form an LLC in Delaware, then uh, the additional cost that you mentioned earlier, yeah. 
if we we come back to california and there is some additional cost we incur correct those things still stand then right correct it's just like personally i'd rather see somebody form an llc in delaware and encounter the additional cost when they come back to california than to go to wyoming and encounter the same additional cost coming back to to california because wyoming doesn't have that case law structure and you run into the same popularity contest issue that you have in alabama or mississippi where it's somebody who doesn't understand the law that's deciding your case and so that's you know i have personally against wyoming this is where getting good legal advice comes yes. into play and that's where the, yeah and that's where the lawyers would really look at your individual you know circumstances they might look at it and say california is fine for your current you know capitalization structure it really just depends on what your structure is and your long-term plans sure so right. nevada too yeah nevada is a good one as well um the reason why delaware and nevada are the two preferred ones is because there's no corporate income tax there so if you don't have operations in those states um you don't have to pay income tax on your earnings and so there's an exemption for out-of-state delaware companies in delaware so that's what why they get formed there a lot nice so she's you're asking if uh if you were to start selling on amazon again yeah he used to be selling no he still does yeah. he still does awesome, awesome. Yeah. so wait that brings a good question though if you were to start over jeff is there a category you'd pick to start selling on gosh what category would i pick not electronics that's <laughs> the one category i would avoid because it seems like all the black hat tactics in the electronics category is you're avoiding like, the question jeff what yeah. category would you pick what category would i pick i don't know home and garden <laughs> something simple <laughs> not not something uh, that doesn't have moving parts and electronics something yeah well it's not even the moving parts and electronics it's your competition because there's so many black hat tactics that go on in the electronics category i mean people are vicious i mean in the electronics category you not only have competitors who are trying to launch better products than you and um and you know try to compete for you know the search algorithm to rank them first but you have competitors that are actively trying to kill your product because that's just the mentality in that category it's like they don't they don't care if they win they just want to see you lose and that's a so i would stay away from that category because that's just <laughs> i mean wow. you're spending so much money on ppc and you're spending so much money on a category that the margins might not be that great and i don't i don't know anything about the electronics category other than just what the horror stories i hear of clients bringing stuff to us and they're like can you fix this and it's like yes but it's going to cost you even more money than you've already encountered in this category so one of them, uh, I'll just start with the first one. One of them, I just, I, I've been looking at this. I, I'm a wholesaler, by the way. I'm okay. not a PL. Gotcha. So um, I've been looking at this one uh, manufacturer, and I was, I've been following them and deciding, okay, I think I'm going to order some products from them. Yeah. Well, they recently started selling on their own products, like within the last maybe two, three weeks. Okay. Um, it's very clear they don't know what they're doing. Um, right. They're priced, you know, $20 higher than the buy box. They're doing FBM. Amazon's on the listing. I don't even know how they Amazon got their products. Yeah. Um, so I was I wanted to approach them and say, hey, I'm an experienced Amazon seller. I'd like to uh, work help you out. You know, I mean, what would you uh, suggest as a strategy? Because I don't know exactly what I could say directly to them that would interest so, them that I can actually help them. So I would go with your strengths. Mm -hmm. So you go to them and say, this is my history. This mm -hmm. is my customer satisfaction rating. This is how we're gonna help promote your brand and grow your business for you on Amazon and show them why they want you. Because if you're just going there saying, I wanna make money off your product, mm. they probably get calls like that right. every day. That's what I didn't wanna do. Yeah, because yeah. like the manufacturers that I work with, they they openly tell me, they're like, yeah, we get, we get calls, probably five calls a day of people that, you know, they're Amazon sellers. The greatest is the Amazon seller. They've been selling for six months and they call them up and they're like, we've been selling for six months. We've made $10,000 a month and we can take your product to the next level. Right. It's like, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you can, you know, <laughs> um, but it's, but yeah, you go to them and you say, this is why you need us to help you out. And you show them what, you know, maybe you show them your work that you've done before. So show them the products that you're currently selling so that they understand that like you've got experience and that you what you bring to the table to offer them so like if you're going to help them with enhanced brand content show them your work before you know all that sort of stuff that makes 
makes the manufacturer want you. Okay. All right. That's good. Thank you. Um, so anyway, again, I'm wholesaler, and I was wondering, uh, legally, Yeah. Uh, let's say that there's a problem with one of the products I'm buying. I'm just a retailer, right? So I'm, I'm buying a product from the manufacturer. Yeah. It's defective, and I'm assuming the manufacturer is the one that would get sued if there is a lawsuit. And what is your experience for smaller Amazon sellers in the retail space that are not PL? So make sure you have um, liability insurance. Okay. And make sure you have, and since you're in California, I would have an umbrella policy on top of the required $1 million policy for Amazon. Okay. Umbrellas are cheaper than, in most cases, it depends. So mm -hmm. you talk to an insurance agent. Um, umbrellas, I think, like for the way it is for us, though, we have a $3 million umbrella on top of our $1 million policy. And the $1 million policy is like $100 a month, and the umbrella is like 20 So you, um, you know, buy as much as you can afford mm -hmm. because unfortunately the way products liability law works in the United States is that if a consumer is injured by a defective product, either the product was defectively designed, which means that the pro a safer alternative was available and the manufacturer didn't do it. So, um, you know, I'm actually dealing with this personally where I had a natural gas grill that I bought from Home Depot and it like when we were cooking on it it basically like exploded and i ended up getting burned and i reached out to home depot and i reached out to the manufacturer and i told him i've got you know both myself and another family member were burned from this grill and it was you know luckily the house was fine because it was on pavers so it didn't actually do like damage to the house otherwise it'd be you know bigger deal but um it was you know i reached out to him but because we purchased it from home depot you know everyone in, that touches that product is liable under the United States scheme. So Home Depot got a letter from me, the manufacturer got a letter, and then the manufacturer, you know, uh, venture capital firm got a letter too because every single one of them was trying to pass the buck. And the second the manufacturer's venture capital firm got the letter, Home Depot called me the next day and said they'd like to take this grill back and give me a full refund. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing how that works. <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, so the unfortunate reality is that like, so a consumer gets hurt with your product that they purchased through FBA. Mm -hmm. They're going to name you. Okay. They're going to name your manu the manufacturer that that makes you know like if you're selling Nike shoes, mm -hmm. you're they're going to name the, re the they're going to Amazon, mm -hmm. the seller, and Nike. And then if there's like a distributor in between there that you purchased from, they'll name them as well if they figure out who it is. And basically the goal of that is to get the money from someone. And so that's why having appropriate insurance matters because Amazon has a clause in their terms of service that if they have to pay out, they come after the seller for the money. Mm. So, and then yes. if you're purchasing from a wholesaler or manufacturer, you should make sure that in your terms, you've got an, an indemnification clause that says that if you pay out money, they have to pay you back. So that ultimately the manufacturer with their products liability insurance is the one that makes the final payment is the goal. But that's why it makes makes it make yeah. sure to have your own insurance because you don't want to be the one left holding the bag yes i've been hearing that but i wasn't sure how it worked like you know are they really going after nike or are they coming after me why would they come after me They're i'm assuming make, they go after nike but this makes a lot of sense what you're saying it's going to be the lawsuit's going to be nike at all uh -huh. so nike and others right. and it's going to be every single person right. in that chain that they can find is right. going to be named and if you know, if you're an LLC, they'll have your LLC name. Mm -hmm. um, lawyers, they'll probably throw your personal name in there too, because then it'll be the burden on you to prove that you're, you know, the corporate veil protects you. And so that's where then they're going to ask, you know, were all your ducks in a row? Did you have this structured properly, or did you borrow someone's legal Zoom form? You know, mm -hmm. did you did you pay yourself a salary, or did you just dip into the company bank account whenever you felt like it? You know all these things that they're going to look at to prove to try to prove that the company is a sham and that you know you personally are on the hook right so they're gonna so unfortunately that's the reality of products okay. liability which is why when i received that call about the out the uh plug-in that had caught on fire i was like <laughs> really really hoping to make that go away quickly because it was it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a fun case you don't want to be in it you know and unfortunately the reality is you you can right. be very good. Well, from an inventory standpoint, yes. um, have you ever tried to bundle uh, products that are in the same niche and create your own listing? Um, I have. Good question. So I've tried that with one uh, listing in particular, and it was, it, they were complementary items, but what I found is that because, you know, I'm not selling private label items, that it wasn't it, it it hurt me more than anything because I was taking away rank from the two main items. 
But I know that a lot of private label people will do that because by bundling items, it makes it harder for someone to hijack your listing. So that's like a great strategy against hijackers. And it also is good for consumers because it sets you apart. So if you're selling a, um, like a, uh, a t-shirt and maybe like a hat would go well with it. Like if you bundle the t-shirt and hat, like that would be a logical combination. So it really comes down to like, you know, you don't want to be bundling, you know, Apple computers with, you know, like power aid, like that doesn't make sense. So really make sure your bundles make logical sense from a consumer perspective. Unless you're playing games on your Mac and you need something to stay up late. <laughs> I don't know, so maybe PS3 and, or PS4 and uh, Monster Energy drinks might work. <laughs> Phenomenal uh, information so far, Jeff. Um, so the question for you, um, you mentioned earlier, like if um, they're like hijackers and stuff and they come to you, you guys do the work and look at, you know, what trademarks, you know, protect them from where, different countries for newer sellers if they don't even have trademark or they're still waiting for their trademark is there anything else that they can do if they experience a hijacker um your options are more limited until you have a trademark because the trademark is really the root of most of the hijack enforcement law um if you decide to um you know sometimes copyright can be an issue an element that we can go after it really depends on what's going on so like in one listing that we've helped a seller with we noticed that you know he didn't have a trademark yet, but he had a patent. And so the person was infringing on his patent. And so that was a clear way to attack the problem. Um, but really trademarks the, the base for most of these claims. Um, tortious interference can be another element that gets brought up. So if there's an, a contract element um, involved, but that's really specific, you know, tortious interference for those of y'all that don't know it is if I have a contract with Rob and that Rob is going to sell my products, and then Rob decides to sell them to, you know, uh, somebody else, you know, and that person then starts selling on my listing, then I might be able to have a tortious interference claim against that person selling on the listing because my contract with Rob said that he can't knowingly sell to somebody who's going to sell against me on Amazon. It's not going to be written like that, of course. It's written in a diversion language, but that's where the tortious interference claims could come in, and that could be another way to get hijackers off the listing, but... That's where it really, you know, the DIY approach to, to hijacking sometimes doesn't work as well as looking at it from a holistic, you know, legal approach to, hi to uh, infringement. Um, the, in terms of cease and desist letters, right? Yes. A, a lot of the, the conversations in the Facebook groups and forums, like people are like, hey, I just received this cease and desist letter. Yeah. And I see a lot of the answers are people like, oh, that's fine, ignore it, right? <laughs> so I guess my question is, what is the, like, what happens next if people decide to ignore these cease and desist letters? Like, you as a lawyer, like, what, what do you guys do as a next step if they just don't respond or don't take down their stuff? Depends on the client. So some clients want you to keep sending, you know, more aggressive cease and desist letters. Um, some clients want you to, you know, some clients will come and they'll say, actually file a lawsuit against them. Because the cease and desist letter, if we're sending it out, is based on a legal claim. So if they're ignoring our cease and desist letter, then the na next step naturally is to pursue legal avenues. Um, and so, for instance, there's a firm out there that a lot of people ignore their letters from. Um, and it's in Ohio, and it's, but they send out these cease and desist letters to a lot of retail arbitrage guys. Um, the issue with ignoring the, their letters is that they've started filing lawsuits now. So their letters used to be, you know, people would light them on fire and make videos of these letters being lit on fire. And the reality of the situation is like, there's still valid law. In fact, they just won a case out here in California um, called uh, Solovich um, versus ADG Health, I think is the, the legal name. And that's like a, it's a legit case that they won and that they're using now. It's non-precedential, but it is, does show that they can win. And so if you ignore cease and desist letters, that's what can happen. I mean, because the company just has to decide that they want to pursue the case and then you're on the hook for it if they win. Okay, so uh, you were talking about the LLCs, Nevada, yes. Delaware. Um, if I were to form an LLC, yes, uh, should it be an LLC or an S corp? Uh, should it be Nevada? Should it be Delaware? Or C corp? Yeah, or Several. C corp. Yeah. <laughs> so what, you know, I'm going to go to uh, my tax guy, yeah, and I'm going to start one, but I don't know which which one would you suggest? What's, what's so the should 
What's so it should be a, a conversation between your lawyer and your tax tax professional. So the tax guy can tell you from a tax perspective which one you want to do, and then your lawyer will help you figure out from the asset protection strategy which one you want. And that's where they work together. The other important thing to remember is that like tax tax people they can form entities, but they can't provide you the documentation that you need to operate. So like for an example, in an LLC, you have to have an operating agreement. And for a corporation, you've got to have bylaws and minutes and all these formalities. And because they're not lawyers, they can't actually provide those to you. Some of them still do, but it's kind of like a use at your own risk type thing. So like there's one person in particular in the space, the Amazon space, who's become the tax guru. And she goes, she talks about how she can provide, you know, S corps and LLCs and everything else, but she's not even a CPA. So like that's pretty dangerous territory to let her be the one deciding your company structure because when when lawyers have a case like you know the case that I had you know like if I per actually pursued it against Home Depot like the first thing I'm going to try to do is figure out is there a you know can I go after the person's personal assets who you know you know, for instance the venture capital firm that owns um, HHG that makes them grills. I'm gonna try to see that there's a way to pierce because the venture capital has way more money than the firm that's just making the manufacturer. And so that's called piercing the corporate veil. And there are lawyers that actually specialize in this. So like there's a, like a law firm that when you obtain a judgment, like say you go to court and you win a $10 million judgment, there's actually a law firm out there that you can go to as a individual who's won money and they help you perfect the judgment. Which means they say, oh, you won 10 million? We're gonna help you collect that. And they take a percentage of everything they collect. And that means that they're gonna go through, they're gonna you know, file subpoenas with all the major banks, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, you name it, they're gonna send subpoenas to try to find all your assets. Then that law firm's going to try to pierce the corporate veil. So they're gonna go and they're gonna say, oh, do you have an operating agreement? Was it followed? So like, for instance, if your operating agreement says that all transactions over $50,000 have to be signed for, um, in the corporate minute book and then they find that you made a credit card payment for fifty two thousand dollars one time They're gonna use that as evidence that you're not following your corporation same thing. They're gonna look and see Like do you have a, co a company car? Are you driving that company car for personal use more than 50% of the time? All these things are used to try to form the foundation of the alter ego theory which says that this company is merely an alter ego for the person therefore the person's assets should be given to creditors of the company and so that's where you know making sure that you're fo you know what you're signing and you know what you're following is comes in, into play uh, you you may have uh, answered this earlier yeah. but uh, I read your uh, background that you actually got started while you were going through law school is that correct um, college is where I got started and then law school was right it kept on growing right so my question is more really how did you just navigate, you know, being an attorney, doing, going through school, doing all that, and building this at the same time? I work like every day. <laughs> I don't know, uh, but I love what I do. So it's for me, time management. Like, I somehow make it all fit. So it's I don't know. It's 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 crazy. <laughs> I have two questions. I want to sure. second that question. Like, um, if you if you have a second chance to start this. Will you consider to start as an FBM? Because I have an, a friend overseas that he never be here, but he started as a FBM with dropshipping, yeah. and I think he's he's doing um, very well. Like he has like thousands of uh, listing, active listing, and then just dropship from from China. And that's my first question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say, I mean, so dropshipping is an interesting beast into itself. Um, there's basically two types of drop shipping. There's allowed drop shipping and there's disallowed drop shipping. So allowed drop shipping is where I go um, as a seller, I find a drop shipper that maybe is a distributor or they're a manufacturer that makes you know um, a product. And when a customer places an order, that person, that manufacturer or distributor ships the order directly to the customer's home. That's totally fine. As long as they're doing so in such a way, like it's there's specific requirements, like the printed materials have to say the customer's name. They can't say necessarily your company's name on it. It's, there's like certain Amazon requirements. Um, disallowed drop shipping is where I create an Amazon store and I crawl the web using software that finds 
products that are available for sale at maybe Kohl's, maybe at Lowe's.com, Walmart, Sam's Club, Costco, um, you name it, they find they crawl. And when they find that the price is cheaper on Amazon, um, they list it for you. And when an order comes in, that software then places the order at, say, you know, Lowe's.com, and then Lowe's ships the order to the customer's house using their free shipping promotion. And um, it seems like a win-win for everyone, except for uh, you violate Amazon's policy and the fact there are two main policies that come into play here the first is that Amazon requires that you ship the products in a neutral box so when it shows up with a shop 24 7 at Lowe's.com that's the first policy violation the second policy violation is the packing slip is going to say sold to you know Jeff and ships to you know so and so in some other random place and that's the other policy that the Amazon, you can't have a packing slip that shows that. So it's, um, Amazon has different ways they figure out about it. Um, if a customer makes a return and they say, I, di I didn't order a product from Lowe's, but I got a Lowe's box, you know, that's going to flag. Amazon's going to look into it. Um, God forbid you ship something from Walmart because they hate Walmart. They're, you know, Amazon is on a mission to kill Walmart. So the second that they get a notification from a consumer that why did I receive a product from Walmart, they're gonna go, they're gonna go guns blazing. Um, the same, you know, situation applies if they suspect it. They'll, um, we've seen them sending out email surveys to customers now. If they start suspecting you of drop shipping, they'll send a, uh, a pretty innocent looking packaging survey to the customer. And basically the packaging survey says, you ordered this product from, you know, XYZ merchants, and we just wanna know how you think about it. You know, how is it packed? What did the box look like? And then that's where a customer can fill in, oh yeah, it came in a, came in a blue and white box. You know, the box said, you know, Lowe's, or it came in an orange box that said Home Depot. And then that's what Amazon now has their evidence that they need to suspend your account. So it works for a while, um, that version of unauthorized dropshipping, but it doesn't, it's not a long-term business strategy because you're gonna get caught and you're gonna get suspended or they're gonna have an authenticity concern. And so they're gonna ask you to provide receipts from your distributor. So when you provide them with a receipt, receipt from homedepot.com that says, thanks for your order, Jeff, we've shipped this item to the customer listed here, that's gonna, you know, that's another dead giveaway that they use to figure it out. So, but I think your version of dropshipping was the authorized one where you place an order and you ship it from China directly to the customer and it's probably using ePacket or some other subsidized mail service that gets to the consumer. Um, that one's fine. I don't see anything wrong with it as long as you're following all the rules. Um, but would I personally do it? Uh, probably not, just because it's just, I find FBA with the prime badge and everything else for consumer confidence purposes, prime makes a huge difference compared yeah. to not yeah, prime. Yeah, prime's huge. I mean, that, yeah. that'd be one reason why I wouldn't do that either is the prime badge. Imagine if we were selling a private label product, yes. right? And then one day, Amazon brand, Amazon basics, they enter into that area, they copy your product. Okay. What can we do? I mean, yeah. I've heard a seller, they will say this, oh, you know what, when I make um, kind of like really good revenue, we kind of like stopped the, the account for a while. And I think that's that's not the thing we should do because they don't want to be on the on the spotlight for Amazon. Interesting. What do you think about Amazon Basics, Jeff? What do I think of Amazon Basics? Um, a lot of the Amazon Basics products are the same as like, you know, like for instance, Amazon Basics batteries, I think are Duracell. So it, uh, there's Amazon basic batteries in these microphones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to say that Amazon basics is crap because for the most part, it's the exact same that you'd find. It's just cheaper. But, um, that is the reality that Amazon, um, a lot of times they'll come along to manufacturers and they'll say, Hey, your product is selling really well on Amazon. Um, you've got two options. You can either sell it directly to us through Amazon vendor central. Um, if you don't want to do that, we'll find somebody who will sell your product to us through Vendor Central. Or they'll come along and they'll say, um, your product is selling so well on Amazon, we'd like you to make a private label version. And again, if you don't do it, they'll find somebody who will. So they don't usually out of the blue just like see that like, oh, this microphone's selling super well. Uh, we're going to go make an Amazon Basics version of this microphone without contacting the person who's got the top seller first. Um, the exception to that is if they know exactly who your manufacturer is, and then they might go to your manufacturer directly. 
But if you're working with a reputable manufacturer, they'll usually tip you off um, and let you know that this is happening. Some of them don't. It just depends on who you're dealing with. So unfortunately, there's no real way to avoid it because Amazon keeps really good records of everything. So like say you're selling this you know, top selling product and you decide to stop selling it because you don't want to get on Amazon's radar. The problem is, is they've already got your history that it was, to, was a top selling product. And when customers keep searching for that product and it's not available, they're gonna try to fill that void. And that's when, again, Amazon Basics might show up instead because you're not selling the product that customers want. Um, but I know that there are, you know, India's taking a stand against Amazon Basics. Um, I think the European Union is taking a stand against it now too. So um, in the future, there might be legislation uh, that is passed in the United States that targets the practice because the reality is Amazon has all the data. They know what sells and they're using it against the very sellers that are trusting them with that data. And so it's uh, it's not a fair level playing field. It's a monopoly at some point. And so that's where they're, you know, but it's, it's really going to come down to like sellers taking action. And so like, for instance, the online merchants guild right now has been really involved in tax and trying to level the tax playing field with marketplace facilitator legislation, which is pending in California, expected to be implemented within the next, you know, couple weeks here. Um, that's going to be a huge boon for sellers so that you don't have as much administrative overhead. You know, you, the 2019 will probably see there's up to 11, just two more were added last week. So there's 11 states collecting marketplace facilitator. By the end of the year, you'll probably see that number around 20 or more, I would think. Um, the online merchant scale is like a group for Amazon sellers. And so when you join it, you know, it's a voluntary, it's tax deductible contribution. It's a nonprofit organization. And they're actually fighting for intellectual property reform. They're fighting for, you know, reforming Amazon and holding them accountable. And so that means getting state and federal laws that, you know, they're lobbying for change that helps Amazon sellers. So they're lobbying to make it where Amazon can't take these predatory practices against sellers and so you know look into it and see because i mean contributions like even 20 bucks it helps advance the mission of that organization the online so, merchants guild jeff here's one for you then yes you, you and correct me if i'm wrong yeah. if you got a unique product patent it right correct i mean if you amazon got, so, can't go take it from you if you got a patent on it correct i mean if you've got an amazing product like and it's totally revolutionary definitely get a patent on it because Amazon Basics won't show up on a patented product unless they're licensing it from you. And to be quite honest, if they do show up on your product and you've got a patent, that's probably, you're gonna get so much more money than if they'd bought it from you that, you know, you'll, ha you'll be happy that that happens. <laughs> so, you know, any lawyer is gonna wanna take that case on contingency and prove that they willfully violated a patent. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, awesome. patents are important. You know, protect your intellectual property if you have something cool. For sure. It's fine. So um, obviously, like for new sellers, right? Yes. They they discover Amazon. They discover FBA. Um, they do their course, and most of these courses, they basically don't talk about. Yeah, go find a lawyer. Go look at patents or anything. It's just like go find these products. Here's the data. This will sell. Go find it on. You know, find a factory. So it's like at what point? And especially because people want to invest, like the little money they saved up, right? Okay, 5,000 right. to start, but like lawyers are the last thing on their mind, right? Right. Paying for a CPA, paying for a lawyer. So it's like, at what point do you think is good for them to come to you? Is it just from the very beginning? What is that investment level to work with someone like you, you know, to do it right from the beginning, um, you know, or not? Yeah. So, I mean, it, every seller is different, but I would almost say like, if you're, like if you've got $5,000 saved up, you know, spending, a ton of it on legal services probably doesn't make the most sense from a financial perspective when you're first starting out. But if you're, you know, if you take that $5,000 and you turn it into $15,000 and then you're going to place another order and you see it continue to grow, like you need to have some threshold where at some point you get to that you're like, when I hit this number, I know that I'm comfortable hiring a lawyer. I mean, that's what I did myself, you know, like I DIY'd it for the first LLC. And then I, but I always had in the back of my mind when I hit this sales threshold, I'm gonna go and get a real lawyer to help get this correct and get it all done. And so it really comes down to risk tolerance and where do you feel, like when do you feel you're gonna have that and just keep watch for it because you don't wanna like, but you have to have a realistic number. So you can't be like, oh, when I reach a million dollars in sales, I'll deal with that problem. Because when you reach a million dollars in sales, um, probably when you've reached 400,000, you're gonna have an issue at some point that you're gonna go, I wish I had that set up. And so you, you know, 
I'd keep that number low, like $100,000 in revenue or $50,000. Every seller is going to be different for what they can tolerate. And then once you get to that point, start thinking about it. So, but yeah, I would agree. If you have $5,000, like, because there's no point spending, you know, roughly, you know, a third of that setting up your company with a lawyer and then spending the rest on products and then realizing that Amazon's not for you. Like it, because that just wasted everyone's time. So I'd keep it number low, <laughs> you know, and then figure it out. So how about another big round of applause for yeah. Jeff for coming out and sharing? Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate Thank you. it. Appreciate it. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more information, please visit feedbackwiz.com.